Hello, and welcome to this Price of Job tutorial. In this video, we will explain how to use the Steel Beam Calculator to BS5950. To get started, we'll go to the top navigation blue toolbar and open the Engineering tab. Then, browse through the Module toolbar, where we can select from a variety of different engineering modules. And here we can open the Steel Beam category, and then select Steel Beam to BS5950. The module appears in the left sidebar within this folder, titled Structure by Default. We can click on the pencil icon to rename the module folder to something more project relevant, such as Extension. Next to the module itself, we can click on the three dots to open the Module Options menu. Here we can rename, duplicate, move, or delete the module. So let's rename this module to something more specific to the calculation we're going to do such as ground floor steel beam number one, and save. And now we can start the steel beam design, starting with the steel beam effective span. Initially, we enter the steel beam span. This is also called the effective span and should be entered in millimeters. The effective span is the sum of the clear span of the steel beam plus the bearing on one side divided by two plus the bearing on the other side divided by two. For example, if you have a 4000 mm clear span and 100 mm bearing on one side and 100 mm bearing on the other side, then the effective span would be 4100 mm. And we can input that manually here in the field or use the slider to adjust the numbers as necessary. We'll just input that directly. 4100 mm. The bearing length can vary from 100 mm to 300 mm or even more. We recommend using a bearing length of at least 100 millimeters. If we click this selection on the left-hand side, we can add a cantilever on the left. If we click a selection on the right-hand side, we can add a cantilever to the right. Next is the utilization limit, and we'll discuss this in further detail a little bit later in the video, but basically this is the percentage of utilization factor which indicates a status of pass or fail. Generally, we recommend the utilization limit to be set to 99%, but again, we will discuss this in greater detail shortly. Next, we'll click on the Options button to input our safety factors and deflection limits. For British standards, we use 1.4 for dead loadings, also known as the permanent load, and 1.6 for live loadings, also known as the variable load. But what are the safety factors? Well, before explaining the safety factors, we have to distinguish two different states. The ultimate limit state, or ULS, which represents the situation in which the beam is offering the maximum capacity so that the beam doesn't fail and the structure doesn't collapse. This state is related to the safety of the structure. The second state is serviceability limit state, or SLS, which represents the situation in which the beam is under normal circulation loadings during the lifetime of the building. In this state, we check the deflections of the steel beam and we want to check that the deflections are within the acceptable limits. So what does all this have to do with safety factors? Well, the safety factors are used in the ULS, not in SLS. In other terms, it is the limit state which is related to safety that we use the safety factors. The calculator multiplies all dead loads by 1.4, and all live loads by 1.6. The safety factors for the SLS are all set to unity, which is a factor of 1. This is automatically done by the calculator. Next we'll look at the restraint. In this selection, we have to identify how the flanges are restrained at both ends. We have end A and end B. We would recommend using the following option. Both flanges only supported with no positive connections. This is the most conservative. If you need additional information related to this type of restraint, you can have a look at publication SCI P360. Next we consider if loads are destabilizing or not. We have an example for this here. If the loading is applied to the centroid of the steel beam or below the centroid, then the loading is not destabilizing. More specifically, if the loading is applied to the bottom of the steel beam below the centroid, then the loading is stabilizing, like in this example. However, if the loading is applied at a level above the centroid of the steel beam section, then the loading is considered as destabilizing. In general, most of the loadings are usually applied above the centroid, and thus it is always prudent 
to check this box. Loads are destabilizing. Next we'll look at the deflection limits. So what are the acceptable deflection limits? For dead loadings plus live loadings, we use the length or span divided by 250. For live loadings, we use the length or effective span divided by 360. When we have cantilevers, we usually use live plus dead loadings combined with length divided by 180. Some engineers and councils across the country are conservative and recommend span divided by 360 for live and dead loadings combined. When we have brittle elements such as bifolding doors, the steel beam above the bifolding door should be designed for a span divided by 500 deflection limit. Practically, that means that the steel beam shouldn't deflect more than the effective span divided by 500. What happens if it does? If it does, then it may crack the window or any other brittle element which will not result in a collapse of the building, but it will damage the bifolding doors, and we don't want that. Now we can close this window and add our loading input. This is where we answer the question, what type of load is the steel beam going to support? If we want the self-weight of the steel beam to be included in the calculations, then we click this box. To start adding our loads, we'll click the plus add new load button. And here we see there are five different types of loadings. A point load, a uniformly distributed load, a partial uniformly distributed load, a trapezoidal load, or a point moment. A point load is a concentrated loading onto the beam. This can be the reaction of another steel beam or a steel post that is supported off the steel beam that we are designing. Or it can be the stair trimmer beams that are supported off the steel beam that we are designing. Uniformly distributed load is a load that is uniformly distributed across the beam. Floor joists or roof loading or wall loading can be in this category. Partial uniformly distributed load is a load that is uniformly distributed across a part of the beam. Floor joist loading or roof loading or wall loading distributed across part of the beam can be in this category. Trapezoidal loading is a loading that has a trapezoidal shape. This could be a gable wall, for instance. And a point moment is a concentrated moment onto the beam. This could be the reaction of a steel post that is rigidly connected to the steel beam that we are designing. Here, we can input the dead loading. This is also called the permanent loading. These are the loadings that remain the same and are applied constantly in a building, such as cavity walls, the floor joists, and the roof joists. Here you can input the live loading. This is also called the imposed loading. These are the loadings that can change, such as people or partition walls. Within the price of job calculator, you can input a loading manually, or you can use the calculator's templates from the system list. For example, let's assume that we have floor joists supported off our steel beam. In this case, if we want to input this manually, we would click the plus add new load button. Then for the title, we would call this timber floor joists. Then for the load type, we would select UDL for a uniformly distributed load, and then manually input the dead and live loading. For instance, 1.2 kilonewtons per meter and 3 kilonewtons per meter. Also, Price of Job makes it even easier by allowing you to access a library of templates by clicking the pencil icon to open the loading editor and then selecting the template button. Here we can browse through the categories including roof coverings, boarding, insulation, timber, finishes, masonry, concrete, and imposed loads such as furniture and snow. So for example, let's take a look at the boarding category and then select the material we wish to add. In this case, we'll choose some 18 mm plywood. By clicking on this, it's instantly added to our load calculator where the load presets are automatically added for us. If you wish to add extra rows, you can do so by clicking the plus add row button and give your material a name and input the values here. We'll say that this plywood is 0.14 kilonewtons per square meter. If you need to delete any of these rows, you can do so by clicking the bin icon here on the right hand column. <clears throat> and you can change these values manually, either for one time use or create your own custom template. 
For this example, let's change the plywood boarding to 0 0.18 kilonewtons per square meter. And we'll also add some insulation with a dead load of 0 0.02. And then we'll add a row to add some joists to our loading with a dead loading value of 0 0.18 kilonewtons per square meter. And then we might add some plasterboard and skim with a value of 0 0.2. An imposed load of mixed use with a live load of 2.5 kilonewtons per square meter. And as an imposed load, we would add this to the live loadings column. If we expect to use these same values again in the future, we may want to save this as a new template. We can do that by clicking the template drop down arrow and then scroll to the very bottom where we can see our custom list. And then we can click on the option to save template. Let's give our custom template a custom name for easy identification. We'll just say ground floor mixed use timber joists and then save. And now when we return to the templates drop down menu, we can scroll to the bottom to our custom list and see all of our saved templates under our custom list to recall instantly whenever we need them. If we no longer need any of these, we can delete it by clicking the bin icon and then confirm the deletion. We can reopen the templates menu and double check our custom list to see that our deletion was successful. Next, we'll input our width of load perpendicular to the beam. This is the total of half of the loading supported on one side of the steel beam added to half of the loading supported on the other side of the steel beam. For example, you might have timber floor joists supported on both sides of the steel beam. If the timber floor joists span 2000 millimeters on one side of the steel beam and on the other side, the timber floor joists span 2000 millimeters and half of the loading on one side and half of the loading on the other side is supported off the steel beam. This would be 2000 millimeters divided by two on one side and 2000 millimeters divided by two on the other side, which gives us a width of loading perpendicular to the steel beam of 2000 millimeters. So we would input that here and then we could close the loading editor window. And here we see the sum of our dead and live loads as a result of our calculations. If you have more loads to add, you can add those by clicking the plus add new load button. Next is the option to show load details. If you click this checkbox for show load details, then the load details will be included in the structural calculations report. And we can see that table here by scrolling down in the description. If we uncheck this box, then the loading details will not be included in the report. Next we'll take a look at the size or section of steel beam. This is where we enter the size of the steel beam section. And we can have two cases. Either we know the size of the steel beam from the beginning and we can choose it, or we choose the automatic search feature. The first process in which we know the size of the steel beam is called steel beam check. The second process in which we don't know the size of the steel beam is called the steel beam design. Initially, we have to choose the quantity of steel beams. We can choose from one to five. Usually we have one steel beam. And then we can choose from five different types of steel beams. Either a universal beam, also called a UB, these are I-shaped. Or a universal column, also called a UC, these are H-shaped. Or a parallel flange channel, also called a PFC, these are C-shaped. Or a square hollow section, also called an SHS, these are square boxes or a rectangular hollow section, also called an RHS. These are rectangular boxes. Next we'll look at the steel beam grade. The steel beam grade is usually S355 or S275. We would recommend using S355 for the design of all steel beam sizes. It has to be noted that the steel beam grade doesn't affect the deflection calculations. It only affects the capacity and stability calculations. Thus, sometimes S275 is issued for RHS or SHS because it is the deflection check that governs their design. Next, we'll take a look at the steel beam restraint. 
This is related to the lateral torsional buckling jack, which we see here in the summary results. It refers to whether the top compression flange of the steel beam is restrained against movement or rotation. The RHS and SHS steel sections do not suffer from lateral torsional buckling mode of failure, and hence it doesn't matter whether they are restrained or not. Hence it refers only to the other three types of steel beam sections, like universal beams, universal columns, or parallel flange channels. If we click the options available, we can choose from either unrestrained or fully restrained. Now is the beam fully restrained or not? The answer is almost always not. The only way to have a steel beam fully restrained is if it meets the requirements in the SCI publication P360. For instance, this happens when you have a beam cast into a concrete floor. Now let's take a look at the description pane to review the results. First we'll talk about the utilization factor. This factor indicates how hard the steel beam is working. If this factor is low, for example 25-50%, to 50%, then the steel beam is working really well and there's almost double spare capacity. What is double spare capacity? It means that if this was the greatest utilization factor, then you could possibly double the loading in this situation and still use the same beam section. On the other hand, if the utilization is much higher, and we've set our utilization limit for 99%, then so long as this factor is at least 99% or lower, then it means that this steel beam would just pass the structural checks. And this is indicated under the status column as either pass or fail. So the utilization limit is a very useful tool. If you're not familiar with this input, then we would recommend setting it to 99%. The calculator takes the greatest amount of these factors from each of these checks. Currently we have the auto search function optimizing our section size for us, so let's deselect this so we can see what happens when we reduce the utilization limit. If the greatest factor is 80.5% and we set our utilization limit to 80%, then this steel beam won't be acceptable and another beam will need to be chosen. And this is because we set the utilization limit to 80 instead of 99%. To gain a status of pass, we could either increase our utilization limit to at least 80.5%, in this case we could say 81, or as we recommend, usually 99%. Or if we require a utilization limit of 80%, then in that case we could use the section auto search function to automatically find a steel beam measurement that achieves a status of pass. So why is there a utilization limit input? Some engineers use this utilization limit to undertake a more conservative design or they may want to have spare capacity in the steel beams so they can have an extra margin of safety. By reducing the steel beam utilization limit, you always end up with a more conservative design. And again, we would recommend leaving this set at 99%. By scrolling down, you can see the results in greater detail. And we'll build a steel beam design example in a different video. But that's how to use the steel beam calculator to BS5950. Thank you for using Price a Job.